Hello, my name is Ian Sinjin, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to the latest in our series of Sinjin's Pipecasts. Today we'll be looking at one of the world's most famous and visually arresting pictures, namely the Arnolfini portrait, painted by the artist Van Eyck, and currently exhibited in the National Gallery in London. Now I am by no means an art historian. A little while ago, I read this fine book by Carola Hicks, which is devoted to the subject of the painting. And adding to this little further research, I put together a talk. And it's this, this talk provides a substance of what I'd like to speak about to you today. So let's just start with some basics. The painting was executed in Bruges, in modern day Belgium, by the Flemish artist Jan van Eyck. In 1434. It is generally regarded to be the first portrait of a non-religious or non-noble couple and sets that couple in a relationship of human interaction within a domestic setting. It is thus, among many other things, a revolutionary picture. So why was Van Eyck in Bruges and why did he paint this picture. Well, Bruges in 1434 was a port town in the province of Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy. The Duke's family originated in Burgundy in eastern France, but through marriage had also acquired land in Flanders, southern Netherlands. After conflict in France, Philip inherited the family lands in 1419 at the age of 23 and shift his power base to Flanders. He then sees further territory in Holland to become the dominant ruler in the area of modern day Holland and Belgium. The extent of Philip's territories can be seen in the dark brown shaded area in this map. The Duke was a great patron of the arts and Burgundy was one of the most cultured states in Europe at this time combining the artistic, state, artistic taste of France with the wealth of the Netherlands. And in 1425, he employed Van Eyck as official court painter. Now, Eyck had been born in the mid-1380s in Mars Eyck in Belgium, and from this place he derived his name. By 1422, he was established as a master painter employing a team of assistants. A leading figure in the Northern Renaissance, Mike was a pioneer in the use of oils, and his pictures were striking for their meticulous use of detail. This painting of a man by Ike is generally considered to be a self-portrait, though we cannot say this for certain. Now, Ike became the official painter to Duke John of Bavaria, who was based in The Hague. But Duke John died in 1425, and it was then that Van Eyck moved to serve as court painter to Philip the Good. His basic role was to glorify the court and the reign of the Duke. He also worked as the Duke's envoy and produced a map of the world for the Duke. In 1432, Ike moved to Bruges, where the Duke was spending a large part of his time, and Ike remained there until his death in 1441. Now Bruges at this time was a prosperous centre of international trade, being known as the Venice of the West. Up to 700 ships sailed from its harbour each day, and the population was about 40,000. The Duke took one-seventh of the town's revenue as tax. Goods from around the world were traded in Bruges. Oranges, lemons, furs from Russia, Italian silks, English wool, timber from Sweden, iron and copper from Prussia, and so on. It was a world of luxury, with fine buildings and refined interiors. But also Bruges was known for its hedonism, 
with bathhouses frequented by both sexes and an active market in prostitution. But in 1437, just after this portrait was painted, there was an uprising against the Duke by the people of Booth, and its oppression led to many executions. Now, of course, as a centre of trade, many foreign merchants lived in Bruges, and these included the Arnolfini family from Lucca, an Italian city-state. There were several distinct Italian groups in the city, in Florence, Venice and so on, combining trade with banking. The city of Lucca specialised in trading silks with Bruges. The headquarters of the Lucca traders was located on Burst Square from 1394. In this headquarters was a consul and a three-man council responsible for supporting the Lucca community and maintain the standards of their trade. Other Italians, such as the Florentines, Genoese and Venetians, also headquarters, had headquarters on the square. Now these Italian traders commissioned artworks by local artists, including Van Eyck, and several of his artworks were acquired by residents in Bruges. The Arnolfini family were one such family of notable Italians from Lucca, and Giovanni de Nicolao Arnolfini lived in Bruges from the 1420s and supplied luxury textiles to the court of the Duke. It seems most likely that Giovanni is the man in the picture, and support for this idea comes from a further painting that Van Eyck did of Giovanni. The figure on the left in this picture is the man in the Arnolfini picture, while the figure on the right is a portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini by Van Eyck, dating from the year 1435. The obvious similarities in depiction, combined with the close proximity in dates, make it very likely that Giovanni is the man in the Arnolfini picture. Now Giovanni married Costanza Trenta, who was also from Lucca, in 1426, when she was just 13 years old. However, she died in childbirth in 1433, at the age of 20, the year before our painting, which possibly means the picture is commemorating the wife and the couple after her death. So, we can probably say that the picture portrays Giovanni Arnolfini, a cloth merchant from Lucca in Italy, who is living in Bruges, with his wife Costanza, who had died the previous year. The couple are depicted in a fine merchant's house in Bruges, and the paintings in the Flemish style. It is a cosmopolitan piece of art, showing cultural assimilation. Above all, it shows for the first time in art a non-noble couple in a domestic setting in a relationship to each other, and this is what makes it truly revolutionary. Let us turn now to the picture itself. The picture is executed in oils, which was a novel medium at the time. It shows a couple standing at the centre of a fairly small room, which is a domestic scene with many items of furniture and emblems of domesticity, as well as religion, located around the room. The light source is a window on the left, which gives depth to the painting and also allows Van Eyck to pick out edges and tones on the otherwise dark clothing of the man, as well as illuminating the lady's face and the contents of the room behind. Although framed by perspective, there is not just one vanishing point. As this picture from an essay by Adrienne Howe shows, there are multiple vanishing points, and the arrangements of some features is not exactly clear. The chandelier seems to be above the couple, though in terms of perspective it is lo located behind them, deeper inside the room, while the mirror is low on the wall and would not have been very usable at that height. Of course, the mirror is situated there to provide a focal point and reflect back the scene in the picture. 
Let us now turn to look at some of the details in the picture. And we start with the man on the left. Now the man seems to be drawn from life. He has distinct features, a long face, high cheekbones and a cleft chin. Indeed, as we have seen, he's very probably Giovanni Arnolfini, who Van Eyck also painted in a regular portrait the following year, when the same features are, are visible. His clothes symbolise that he is a man of wealth and fashion. He's wearing dark colours, a fashion pioneered by Duke Philip, with brown fur linings. The colours are dyed rich plum and black and these signify his seriousness and his virtue. His outer garment is a hook, a long sleeveless tabard open at the sides. Originally worn over armour, it had since the early 1400s become fashionable civilian wear. It is made of silk velvet, a key export of Luca. Velvet was very costly to make and dark colours were the most expensive of all, involving the use of the Kermes parasite, which lived on the leaves of oak trees in the southern Mediterranean, so it so had to be imported from places like Damascus. Even more important was the fur lining, a feature of real wealth. The fur was that of a pine martin, the second most prestigious type of fur after sable, where sable came from a small martin animal living in Russia and Central Asia, but sable could only be worn by kings and princes. Pine martin fur also came from Russia and northern Scandinavia, so it was also expensive, and it was traded in Bruges. A calf-length tabard of the kind worn by Onolfini would have required at least 100 skins. Beneath the tabard in the picture is a black doublet of satin. The man is also wearing long woollen stockings, which were especially in Bruges and been mentioned in the Canterbury Tales. He is wearing soft leather ankle boots, and then he, he would have worn wooden overshoes known as patterns, which have protected his soft wood, uh, leather shoes from the muddy and rough roads outside, and these outer shoes are depicted in the bottom left of the picture. Arnolfini's hat is a beaver style but made with woven straw. These straw hats also came from Italy and dyed black ones were particularly expensive. The man's hand is raised in a gesture almost of benediction, though in earlier versions of the picture by Van Eyck the hand was raised at a less steep angle. Let us turn now to the woman. Now the woman is less distinctively depicted. Unlike the man, she is not a clearly defined person. Her features are rather caricatured and less realistic. Her forehead is rather too large, and the rosebud lips are those characters to be found on angels. This probably reflects the fact that Costanza, the likely woman in the picture, was dead by the time the painting was done, and Van Eyck may never have seen her, and certainly not painted her. As such, she is a kind of idealised woman, not a figure drawn from actual life. Her clothes again betoken wealth. Notice the vast amount of fabric she is wearing. Even though she's holding her dress up, it still trails all over the floor, and it's estimated to be about 35 metres in length. It was a woollen gown, spun in Flanders from Spanish or English wool, and circle in shape with a high belt. Her huge sleeves were known as bag sleeves. The gown had a fur lining, and squirrel fur was used and it's rather sobering to think up to 2,000 squirrel furs were required for such a gown, so again it would have been very expensive. Under the green gown is a blue underdress, which also has a fur trim. The woman's feet are not shown, but she is probably barefooted as her sandals are shown at the back on the floor. 
Now these sandals are red and open with brass studs and were fashionable at the time. Red dive sandals were particularly expensive, the red dye coming from the, from the sapan tree in India. So in one sense too the woman is shown to be the fashionable wife of a prosperous merchant. However her head covering is simple, a modest linen folded five times. It was not large and high as one by aristocratic women. It was appropriate indeed for a merchant's wife, such as she was. Her dress, though expensive, was a bit out of date in 1434. Colours like red, green and blue were more fashionable in the 1300s. By the 1400s, dark browns and blacks, as worn by the man, were much more in fashion. Green was a cheaper colour to dye than were dark colours. The long baggy sleeves were also more of a fashion of the 1300s than of the 1400s. The lady has little jewellery, just two rings on her left hand and a double gold chain around her neck. Now there was of course a great class hierarchy in dress. A merchant's wife should not overdress and try to emulate noble women. The woman in the picture therefore conforms very much to this convention. One question that arises is whether the woman is pregnant. It's not clear. She certainly looks pregnant at first glance. But this may simply be key, simply be key because she's holding so much cloth in her hand. Also the Arnold Phoenix had no recorded children. Though it's often said that Costanza may well have died in childbirth. However, Ike did often emphasise a woman's stomach in all of in his paintings to symbolise fertility. So even if she's not actually pregnant, she looks as if she might well soon be. Possibly the picture celebrates a long-awaited pregnancy, even though that pregnancy was to end in sadness. Let us now turn to some of the objects in the room. Let us first take a first look at the beads and brush which are on the wall behind the couple. Now to the left of the mirror can be seen a string of paternoster beads. Made of amber, the beads are strung on thread and they are used for counting prayers. Such beads were made in Bruges and the guild of paternoster makers had about 70 masters. The amber was fossilised resin extracted from the Baltic Sea and shipped to warehouses including those in Bruges. They were for private use and symbolised a woman's piety and were often given by men as a wedding, wedding gift. The brush to the right of the mirror was made of soft twigs. It represents domestic cleanliness and order and was associated with the Virgin Mary. Next we come to the mirror, one of the picture's most notable features. Mirrors were a great status symbol, rare and expensive, very few people had them. The round convex shape was the only type then available and was made from blown glass. These mirrors were sourced from Nuremberg in Germany. Around the mirror are ten enamelled roundels depicting scenes from the life of Christ. An intriguing aspect of the mirror is it reflects back the scene of the painting in reverse. Note that it depicts two more people besides the Arnold Phoenix in the room. There is Van Eyck and his assistant shown entering the room. Note too that the dog is absent in the mirror which shows that the dog was added to the picture at a later stage. Above the mirror are the words Johann van Eyck Fui Hick. Jan van Eyck has been here. The date is 1434. The mirror gave an extra dimension to the picture, but also demonstrated Eyck's skill as an artist. Above the couple is a chandelier. This is made of polished brass. It was probably included for artistic reasons, to give a central access to the picture 
above the couple. It's really too big and elaborate for such a room. Candles also were expensive and very few domestic homes had them in 1434. If you look carefully, you'll see that one candle is lit, which is odd on a bright summer's day. This candle is above the man. The other candle, above the woman, has just gone out, and one can just about see the wax running down the side. Again, this may signify her death. Turning now to the furniture in the room, on the left by the window is a chest. This would have been serving both as a seat and as a store cupboard. Such chests were known as hutches. It stands off the ground to protect from the damp and is made of oak. Against the far wall is a bench seat, this projecting footboard, known as a settle, which is draped in red cloth. Note the two grotesque figures carved on its wooden arm, seated back to back. These are above the woman's hand, and may again symbolise her death. To the right of the settle is a high-backed chair, which is only partially visible. Now such a high-backed chair would have been for the head of the house to sit on, and of course for any distinguished visitors. The chair is upholstered, has a high wooden back elaborately carved in architectural relief. The arms of the chair end in carved lions. Visible on the top corner of the chair is image of woman with a halo rising from a winged dragon. The figure might be St Margaret of Antioch, who escaped from the stomach of a monster and who was the patron saint of childbirth. It might also be St Martha, the patron saint of housewives, who had also overcome a dragon and was associated with a brush, and of course a brush hangs just adjacent to the figure. Now the bed is the largest piece of furniture in the room, and dominates the right hand side of the picture. It is richly adorned with hangings, and by placing such a fine bed in the reception room, it demonstrated the wealth of the owner. The main feature of the bed is the sumptuous and expensive cloth hanging from it and hanging down from the canopy above. This cloth is dyed red and was known as scarlet cloth and it was expensive. Just one piece of scarlet cloth cost roughly the wages of two years of a master mason. So maybe in modern terms around £80,000 just for one piece. Let us turn now to the remaining details in the picture. And first of these are the oranges. There are four oranges in the picture, one on the window sill and three on the chest. Now of course they provide a lighter colour to relieve the darkness of the chest and also give a chance for Van Eyck to show his skill as an artist. They are a pioneering form of still life. Symbolically, oranges were a symbol of fertility and they were also associated with the Virgin Mary who apparently fed oranges to Jesus during their flight to Egypt. They were also rare and expensive in Bruges, as they had had of course to be transported from the Mediterranean. They cost about six times the price of an apple. Turning to the window itself, we see too that it has fascinating and elaborate detail. In the upper part of the window, are six panels, each of which is framed with lead and filled with a series of small panes of round crown glass. Crown glass, made from drops of molten glass, was the basic form of window glass at this time and it was expensive. Most homes did not have glass windows but only wooden shutters. The spaces between the round crown glass is filled with green glass while running around the borders are strips of blue, red and yellow stained glass, which would have cast coloured strips of light into the room on sunny days. Beneath the glass window, the rest of the window is shuttered, with wooden doors on hinges. Behind the window, outside, we can just about see a cherry tree. The tree is in fruit, 
But the picture is set in early summer and the fruit symbolizes prosperity, fertility and sweetness. Turning now to the rug. Rugs were rare and expensive in the 15th century. They are imported from the Turkish province of Asia Minor, that is Islamic geometrical patterns. Since they were so expensive, they were made really for display, not for actual walking on. And the woman in the picture is not actually standing on the rug. Rugs were often associated with the images of the Virgin Mary, and it was considered good form to have a rug next to a bed. In the picture, the decoration of the rug consists of petalled flowers and alternating geometric designs. Lastly, we have the dog. Now the dog, situated at the feet of the couple, is a breed known as a Brussels Griffon. It had been bred locally over many years, descended from dogs that were used for rat catching. The dog was added to the painting at a late stage. It wasn't present in the initial underdrawings, and does not appear in the mirror image of the room, as we've already noted. This completes our survey of the content of the picture. And at this point, it's probably relevant to ask, what is the meaning of the picture taken as a whole? Why was it painted? And what was it trying to achieve? Besides demonstrating Van Eyck's skill as an artist, and to create a visually engaging image. At one level, the obvious point is to commemorate and celebrate the world of a successful mercantile couple living in Bruges. One must assume this is the primary purpose, since the Arnolfi Arnolfini family commissioned the picture and paid for it, and had themselves painted inside a room which must have borne some relationship to the kind of room they did inhabit and the kind of life they lived there. They are proud of their room and of themselves of their success and of their wealth. This is the general theme of the picture, which emphasises, as we have seen, costly forms of clothing far beyond the reach of most people, of a room with luxurious objects, often drawn from far lands, and all expensive. If the man is indeed Giovanni, then he was a cloth merchant, and so the abundant rich fabrics in the picture make perfect sense. While we don't know if the couple actually possessed the objects in the picture, for example the chandelier was inserted later and seemed somewhat out of keeping with the room, they must have been objects the couple were happy to be associated with and not seen as excessively incongruous. So in this sense, the picture depicts a successful loving couple amidst their well-adorned and comfortable home. But is there a deeper meaning beyond this rather obvious characterization. Now two theories are particularly well known in connection with this painting. The first was put forward by Erwin Panofsky, a refugee from Germany, who argued in, 14, in 1934 that the picture represents a marriage ceremony between the Arnolfinis. The marriage was, he argued, an unofficial one, since no priest was present. The man's hand is raised as if he's making a pledge or an oath. And the reason Van Eyck appears in the picture, in the mirror, and the reason his signature is so clearly visible, is to testify that he bore witness to the marriage. This also explained the presence of the marital bed and other symbols of fecundity and chastity, and this became the established interpretation of the picture for many years, though of course it faced several problems. First, if the marriage was sent to be a secret one, why broadcast its existence through a picture? Second, if the woman is indeed pregnant, the picture cannot be of a marriage, as not only was it as a secret marriage sinful, but to have the bride actually pregnant at the time of marriage was doubly shocking. Thirdly, if the man is Giovanni Arnolfini, then he married his wife in 1426. So a secret marriage in 1434 seemed on the face of it improbable. The other leading theory is, as we've hinted at at several points in our narrative, that the picture commemorates the marriage of Giovanni to Costanza after her recent death, 
probably in childbirth. This theory is developed by Margaret Costa and it too makes sense of several aspects of the painting such as first the single candle over Giovanni and the recently spent candle over Costanza. Second, the lack of detail and realism in the woman's features. Third, the carving of St Margaret the patron saint of childbirth on the chair. Fourth, the bed upon which she may have died during childbirth. And lastly, the bright colours of the woman's clothing compared to the muted dark colours of the husband which would then be much more appropriate for someone who was in mourning for their recently departed wife. Of course, if Costanza died in 1433, it is possible the picture commemorates Giovanni's marriage to a new wife. But I have seen no evidence that he did marry so soon afterwards, indeed that he remarried at all. On balance, Carola Hicks concluded that the picture simply depicts a successful, well-to-do, Bruges-based couple. The couple are married, and the man is very likely Giovanni Arnolfini. But whether the woman is his deceased first wife, Costanza, or a new wife, we don't yet know. What we do know is that the picture is remarkable for its exquisite detail, its somewhat mysterious arrangement, and for being the first painting of a bourgeois couple in a domestic setting. Thank you.